Um, for this new exhibition, Sore Spots, I, um, I really wanted to try and get my paintings a little bit out of the home and also to focus on um, some more public settings. And in the past, a lot of my work has featured um, one person or one person in a small group, like a family. So I wanted to just kind of expand um, my realm a little bit and uh, get outside the house. <laughs> so um, this group of work is a little bit more difficult for me to summarize because I didn't make uh, one model and spend a year or two working from just the one model. I made a lot of individual little models for each painting that I wanted to make as I wanted to make it. Um, and that was really freeing in a way, um, uh, but it does make it more difficult to talk about now. <laughs> One common thread I think that I have seen now that the work is all finished um, is kind of this tension between the public versus the private. Uh, so many of the places I've chosen to depict, like a doctor's office uh, or a church, um, or a theater, uh, they're public places where you still have this very um, introspective experience, but you're with a group of people, so it's kind of like when you're at the movies and it's a good drama and it makes you want to sob, but there are like 30 other people in the room, so it's totally inappropriate to do that. So you, you're left with this kind of knot in your throat and it's just kind of that um, discomfort that um, kind of provided the inspiration for many of the images. The models are really time consuming to make. I, um, I like to have all the details that I want to include in a painting in the actual model so that I can um, really observe the way light comes across and get a really natural sense. But at the same time, there are so many um, strange things that happen in the little props, just kind of shifts of scale. Um, like for instance, this light here sitting on top of this cabinet um, is just so huge. Uh, and you know, just to look at it as a toy, you don't really think about it, but then I think those sorts of inconsistencies translate into the painting to make it feel like something's off and it gives it a little bit more of the kind of dreamlike or memory-like quality that initially inspired the painting to begin with. So I try and keep those things in. Yeah, and sometimes I have um, like uh, an idea of, I have this church and I'm not exactly sure what I want to do with it. I'm just trying to see what comes out of it. So I end up just collecting all of these figures that seem appropriate for that setting and I'll kind of keep them in a group and just think about them and um, try different arrangements and see see what emerges. So that's very much like playing when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, it took me um, probably um, maybe a month or so to make the church and the whole landscape. I make the landscape out of um, styrofoam and use kind of a cheese grater handheld tool to kind of carve um, rolling hills and that sort of thing. And then the trees are reused from my lake model and before that the neighborhood model. I just love that all these little um, very modest materials like cardboard <laughs> and wire and foam and styrofoam can end up creating such a convincing world. Um, and it um, feels totally worthwhile to me to spend that time um, making each model. Uh, at some point I do start to get impatient to get to the painting because that's really the part I love the most. Um, and this gets a little bit uh, tedious after a while and I just want to get to the reason I'm making it. <laughs> um, 
but it is very time consuming. <laughs> yeah, so this is the setup um, here with this um, little well type thing uh, for the painting uh, smoke signals. And I had a little light shining up through it. Um, and there's only one little guy left here. Um, but I had this crowd assembled. Uh, and initially, I was thinking about this story that was in the news about this pastor from Florida who uh, wanted to burn a Quran in protest. And it just seemed so crazy. And there were most people, I think, had that take. But um, there's just been so much uh, sentiment along those lines that uh, I was really um, interested in trying to get that atmosphere, that mob crazed atmosphere going on. And um, by the time I got everyone assembled, they seemed less um, like a mad mob and more like this desperate group of people looking for some spiritual answer or um, guidance. So I actually felt much more connected to that kind of concept than the initial intellectual inspiration. So um, it's that happens a lot with the model, where I have one idea initially, and I make the arrangement in 3D, and then something else emerges uh, that's more meaningful to me, and that's what I end up trying to capture in the painting. So this is the model that I made for um, the painting understudy and the monotype dress rehearsal. Um, it was quite tedious to make, to cut out all these little <laughs> seats um, and have them come back into space in the right amount. Um, but I have this arrangement of chorus girls and then this painted backdrop with the illusion of more chorus girls. And I tried to paint it off to the side so that you could see this uh, understudy waiting in the wings. Um, and I just wanted to make a painting about this kind of fake trick that you would only understand is um, an illusion if you get it right from the right vantage point. So, so for the monotypes, um, I end up uh, painting on a piece of plexiglass, and a lot of them have been five by seven inches. <laughs> uh, so I set it on a whiteboard um, like this, and uh, set up in front of my model and I have to work very quickly and get the painting done within about a day's amount of work so eight to ten hours before the paint starts to dry because then uh, if the paint dries it doesn't offset onto the paper so once I have the painting finished I can lay it on my press bed and put a blank piece of paper over it and run it through. And you run it through slowly so it doesn't smear my painting, although sometimes that happens, which is very frustrating after a day's worth of work. Um, and then uh, I get to see um, the painting that came off. And then I have just a little while where I can make some quick retouches. Um, and sometimes it's really exciting to see um, because a lot of changes happen in the paper, uh, the way it absorbs it or smushes the brush strokes. So there are some really exciting accidents and some that I can't live with and I have to try it again. <laughs> so it's a really um, fun process for me because it's so immediate and um, it's just so quick compared to my regular painting process that might take a month or even two months on one, one image, as I can do this in a day. <laughs> uh, back in 2006 or so, I think, um, I went to the Armory show um, really with blinders on to um, the names of the galleries or where they were from. Um, and just intentionally wanted to see where I felt the connection with the work and then made a little list of a half a dozen or, or I think it was even smaller than that galleries and um, 
when I had my first show in Chicago uh, at Linda Warren Gallery, Linda was extremely generous and made a catalog for me and offered to send it wherever I wanted it to go. And um, Magnus was at the top of my list. And um, she asked, do we really need to send this to <laughs> internationally? <laughs> and um, I didn't have very high hopes because I understood that he really focused on Swedish art. Um, but still, I really just admired the work so much that I wanted him to see my work. Um, and luckily, uh, it was amazing, but it was in, within the same week that I connected with Richard Heller Gallery in Santa Monica and uh, Magnus. They both got in touch and expressed interest in seeing the work in person. So I sent them each a painting, and things developed from there, and I've just felt so lucky ever since. <laughs>